That's when my attitude changed. From being antagonistic to refute it. To I really believe, young people, I became an honest inquirer. Not to prove it true, not to prove it false, but just to examine the evidence and ask the question, is it true, and let the chips fall. But, oh, I never dreamed. I never dreamed, especially when I was your age and older, that there was so much evidence. Let me show you what I mean. That's why it took me, after I came to Christ, to write this book right here, this one I was talking about. It's a huge one. It just got selected as 100 most influential books of the last century. And I set out to write this against Christianity. After I came to Christ, I spent 13 years documenting the evidence of why it's true. I never knew there was so much. And what I want to do, I want to share with you just one little piece of it. Just one little piece. But you're going to have to give me your minds or you will miss it. If you don't think this through with me, you will miss it. It's something Jesus appealed to. In Luke 24, Jesus went to his disciples and he said, guys, don't you get it? You know, they really, they didn't get it. And Jesus said, now give me your minds. You with me there, young lady? Think through me with your mind. Jesus said, everything that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. What Jesus did was this. In the Old Testament, there's 333 prophecies about who the coming Messiah would be all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And Jesus appealed to them. These prophecies were all written down 500 years before Christ was born. I had a professor say to me, I don't think that happened. I don't think these prophecies were even written down after Jesus was born. Then they wrote them out to make it look like they were fulfilled in his life. I said, well, that sounds pretty good, unless you want to think. I said, sir, the Septuagint, don't let that big word throw you. The Septuagint, now get this, is the Greek title given to the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. You with me, young lady? They took the Old Testament and they translated it into Hebrew. And all the prophecies were translated into Hebrew, I mean into Greek, and they called it the Septuagint. I said, sir, history confirms the Septuagint was completed over 200 and years before Christ was even born. I said, you don't have to have the whole loaf sliced to realize. If 200 years before Christ you have the prophecies, you got the same problem if you say it's not 500 years. And all these were fulfilled in Christ. I really believe that in many ways God gave these prophecies for people like me and people like some of you there who are skeptical and you need, you need something concrete. In fact, as a non-believer, I looked at these prophecies as God writing an address. That's right, to identify a son. For remember, buddy, past, present, future. Do you know your address separates you from six and a half billion people alive? Even if it's general delivery, it's separate. In the same way, God wrote an address to identify his son, and he did it through prophecy. Now, I want to relate just a small number, just a handful of these prophecies. Now, here's the problem. I am going to talk faster than you have probably ever had any, heard anyone talk, especially in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I am going to rival an auctioneer. I'm going to. If you want all the facts and documentations in that book, the new evidence that demands a verdict. Now, you're going to have to listen fast or you will miss it. Here's God write an address to identify his son. Now realize I could do this with all 333 prophecies. I'm only going to do it with a small handful. Let's go all the way back for a quarter time in Genesis 3.15. God said the first indication of the Messiah would be he'd be born of the seed of the woman. Everybody else in the Bible is referred to the seed of the man except for the Messiah. Why? The virgin birth. And we go down to recorded time. Noah had more than just a boat. He had three kids, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Do you realize every nation in the world can be traced back to one of these three individuals? Now God eliminates two-thirds of the nation in the world. When he says that my son will not only be the seed of the woman, but the lineage of Shem. Now in the lineage of Shem, God called a man out of the earth of the Chaldees in the name of Abraham. And he said, now you can know who my son is because he'd be born in the seed of the woman, lineage of Shem. 
descendant and the descendants of Abraham. Now, Abraham had eight children. Now, God eliminates seven eighths of the descendants of Abraham. When he says that my son will not only be of the seed of the woman, leading the descendants of Abraham, but the line of Isaac. Now, Isaac had two children, Jacob and Esau. Now, God eliminates 50% of the line of Isaac. Any of you who have ever studied math in high school will see the phenomenal probability building up historically. When God says that my son will be of the seed of the woman, leading the descendants of Abraham, line of Isaac, line of Jacob, the line of Isaac, and the line of Jacob. Now, Jacob had 12 children, out of which developed the 12 tribes of Israel. In Genesis 49 10, God eliminates the and twelve tribes of Israel. When he says of my son, will not only be of the seed of the woman, leaning the descendants of Abraham, line of Isaac, line of Jacob, but of the tribe of Judah. And when the tribe of Judah, there are many family lines. Isaiah eleven one, God eliminates every single family line but one. When he says of my son, will be of the seed of the woman, leaning the descendants of Abraham, line of Isaac, line of Jacob, tribe of Judah, but of the family of Jesse. Now Jesse had eight children. Now God eliminates seven eighths of the family line of Jesse. When he says of my son, will be of the seed of the woman, leaning the descendants of Abraham, line of Isaac, line of Jacob, tribe of Judah, family of Jesse, but of the house of David. Then we go down to about thousand twelve B.C. with a very unusual prophecy in Psalm 22, where God says, you can identify my son, because he'd be born of the seed of the woman, leaning Shem, sons of Abraham, line of Isaac, line of Jacob, tribe of Judah, family of Jesse, house of David, be crucified, his hands feet pierced against a tree. Somebody says, look, thousands of people were crucified. I said, that's right, but that method of crucifixion, young ladies, was not put in until 800 years after the prophecy. Then God narrows it down further. In one day, 29 prophecies were ful fulfilled in Christ. Here's seven of them in Psalm 41, Zechariah 11. God says, you can identify my son, because he'd be born of the seed of the woman, leaning Shem, sons of Abraham, line of Isaac, Line, Jacob, Travis, Jacob, family, Jesse, house of David, be crucified, be trade, buy a friend, 30 pieces, not 29.99, ladies, 30 pieces of silver, not gold, fourth would be thrown on the floor, not placed on the table, six would be in the temple, seventh would be used to buy a barrel of plot. Then God narrows it down further. Micah 5 2 eliminates every single city in the world but one for his son's entrance in humanity. When he says, My son will be at the seat of the woman, lean Shem, son of Abraham, line of line, line, Jacob, Travis, Jacob, family, Jesse, house of David, be crucified, be trade, buy a friend, 30 pieces of silver, thrown on the floor, in the temple, used to buy a barrel of plot, but his interest in humanity will be in that little tiny city of Bethlehem of Freda, less than a thousand people even lived there when the prophecy was made. And then God narrows it down further. A, pro a professor said to me, you think if God was that smart, he could have told you when it would happen. I said, he did. In Malachi 3.1, you might call it Malachi, but in Malachi 3.1, God says, you could know who my son is because he'd be born of the seed of the woman, lean shem, son of Abraham, line of Isaac, line of Jacob, tribe of Jacob, family of Jesse, house of David, be crucified, be trade, buy a friend, 30 piece, of silver, thrown for him. in a temple used to buy a barrel plant, and in humanity, being a little city, tiny Bethlehem, and it all happened before the destruction of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. When did that happen? 70 AD. 333 prophecies written down over 500 years before Christ was born, all fulfilled in Christ. I had another man say to me, It's all a coincidence. <laughs> I said, A coincidence? He said, Yes. I said, Dr. Peter Stoner. In his book, Science Speaks, figured, using the modern science of probability, figured out the probability of only eight, not 333 of these, just eight of the prophecies being fulfilled in any one individual. And the American Scientific Affiliation checked out his statistics and said he was scientifically accurate. And what it came out to be is one in every one times 10 to the 17th power. One in every quadrillion possibility. This is what it will look like. How do you know what's true is really true? That's where the evidence comes in. Christ's offer to turn you into a new person is real if his claim to be God is true. So let's consider the evidence of eight prophecies proving his claim is true. Do you know what the probability factor is of only eight prophecies being fulfilled in Jesus? No. A one in ten to the seventeenth power. One in ten to the seventeenth power. Huh? That's one in ten to this many times. I don't get it. If you were to take ten to the seventeenth power Girl Scout Thin Mint cookies. How many? That's over a quintillion cookies. And spread them across the state of Texas. Yeehaw! They would cover every inch of the state and form a pile of Girl Scout Thin Mint cookies two feet deep. That's a lot of Thin Mints. A whole lot of Thin Mints. Now take one more Thin Mint and lick all the chocolate off, toss it into that pile and stir the whole thing up. Blindfold yourself, walk the entire state from Amarillo to Laredo, stopping just once to stoop down and pick a single blind Thin Mint cookie. Got it. Take off the blindfold. Aw, oh, nuts. 
The chances of you picking the chocolateless cookie is the same as the chance that one person could have fulfilled just eight prophecies about Jesus in one lifetime. That's crazy. It's unthinkable. But Jesus Christ did not fulfill eight prophecies in one lifetime. Whoa. He fulfilled over 300. 300, girl! Whoa. And 29 of them in just one day. The prophecies are historically documented. The facts that actually happened to Jesus are historically documented. There's only one thing left to do. I know, for me to weigh the evidence. It's all part of the evidence. Because if it is true that he is the son of God, what he offers you, a new life in him, is real. Now I know it's real, whether I believed it or not. It's all part of the evidence. That's when, for the first time in my life, I stated, it is true, I am loved. For God became man, and his name is Jesus. That is real, it is relevant, and it is true. And that led to a conflict in my life, to accept it or to reject it. Because I was convinced, young people, the Bible was true. I've debated that in universities all over the world. I knew the Bible was true, and I knew the Bible said, but to as many as received him, to them gave you the right to become a child of God. I used to think just going to church made you a Christian. Just, just going to church doesn't anymore make you a Christian. Walking to McDonald's makes you a Big Mac. It doesn't work that way. I found out I needed to exercise my will and place my trust in Christ as Savior Lord. So when I returned to the university from trying to write that book against Christianity, I became a Christian. Somebody said, how do you know? I was there. It changed my life. I got a with a friend of mine. I made sure my other friends weren't watching. I was a coward. And I prayed four things that literally transformed my life in a God who became man, and his name was Jesus. The first thing I prayed was, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. The most humbling thought I've ever had to this day was as a non-believer, when I realized if I were the only person alive, Jesus still would have died for me. Most people think I came to Christ through the intellectual route because of the debates I've done all over the world and the books I've written. But men and women, all the books that I've written, 97 of them with all the documentation, none of that brought me to Christ. None of it did. All it did was show me that it was true. Once I was convinced it was true, then I considered its message. What brought me to Christ was the love of God. When I realized he would have gone through all of that just for me. I want to show you a video clip. We had permission for Mel Gibson to use this clip a long time before it came out in the theaters. And the first time we used it was in a huge arena with about 6,000 students out. I sat over to the side of the auditorium, and as this clip I'm going to show you came on, I started to cry, and I couldn't stop crying because it hit me. What you're going to see, I realized, if I were the only person on the face of the earth, Jesus still would have gone through this. Now, as we show you this clip, it's about three and a half, four minutes long. I want every one of you to realize, young ladies, that Jesus would have done this just for you and you and you and you and me. Let's go to the clip of The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson.
second I said, I confess I'm a sinner. I knew the Bible was true, and the Bible said for all have sinned. All you had to do was spend a day with me. I knew there were things on my life incompatible with a holy, just, righteous God. And I knew the Bible said, wow, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. So I said, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I accept your forgiveness. Third, I said, right now, the best way I know how. And I knew the Bible said, but to as many as received him. So I said, I receive you into my life. I accept you as my personal Savior and Lord. I place my trust in you. The last thing I prayed was something like, just thank you. And nothing happened. Nothing. Wasn't he bolt of lightning? I didn't rush out and buy a harp. Well, something did happen. Almost instantly, I felt like I was going to vomit. I thought I was going to chuck my cookies. Oh, I hear these people say they came to Christ and were overwhelmed with joy and everything. I came to Christ and I wanted to throw up. And I think for two reasons. One, I was, I remember having this thought. Josh, have you made an emotional decision you will later regret intellectually? And that scared me. But more than that, I was afraid of what my friends would say. I didn't have the faith in to understand that most of my friends would end up coming to Christ. Somebody had to come first. Well, I was the hardest nut to crack. And then after that, just one after another came to Christ. But I didn't know that at the time that I made that decision. And I just said, thank you for dying on the cross for me. In about six months, a year, year and a half, my entire life was transformed. I just want to share one area to close with. It's an area I'm not proud of. I'm ashamed of. It relates to my father. I hated my father. I despised everything that my dad stood for. I just wanted him dead so he would quit hurting my mother. When I was the age of many of you, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, I don't think I ever went to bed that I didn't plot my father's death, how I could kill him without being caught by the police. But after I made that decision to place my trust in Christ as Savior and Lord, the same decision I'm going to ask you to make. I want you to think about that. I'm going to ask you to make that same decision that I was asked to make as a student. And the reason is because, one, God loves you, and he's passionate about a relationship with you, and I care about you. And after I made that decision to place my trust in Christ as Savior and Lord, a love, I'm going to say the love of God through Jesus Christ came into my life. And I took that hatred and turned it upside down. And I found myself looking my father right in the eyes and say, Dad, I love you. That scared me. I didn't want to love my dad. I didn't. Even as a new Christian, I chose by an act of my will to hate the man who had killed my mother and destroyed my family. My one sister committed suicide. Mother brother ran away from home and hasn't come back yet years later. My other brother sued my parents for everything they had. It wasn't a very functional family, folks. But I found myself saying to the man, I chose to hate, I love you. That's when I knew it was real. I wasn't used to that. I was used to loving those I wanted to love and hating those I wanted to hate. I wasn't accustomed to loving those I chose to hate. That's when I knew I'd been born again. That's when I knew I'd gone into God's family. I transferred to Wheaton College. I was in a serious car accident. When they took me out of the hospital, they called my father. He was drunk, so he thought I was dying. I wasn't. I was just hurting a lot. They took me 127 miles home in an ambulance. They took me into the farmhouse, into my room. They strapped me in there with steel all over my body. I couldn't move my head or anything. All I could do was flash my eyes, and I could hear the ambulance leave. And in about five minutes, my father walked into that room. And all I could do was flash my eyes to look at him. And one, he was sober. But second, he was crying. I had never, ever seen my father cry. The only emotion I'd ever seen in my father when he got angry at my older brother Wilmot or my mother. And he didn't say anything. Here I am strapped in bed like this. And he just walks alongside the bed, paced back and forth, probably no more than three, four minutes when you're strapped in bed. It seems like eternity. And all of a sudden, my father just stopped. He was just crying. And he leaned right over my face, just like this. And he said, son, how can you love a father such as I? 
I said, Dad, six months ago, I despised you. I hated everything that you stood for. But then I said, Dad, I've learned something, that God became man, and his name is Jesus, and he is passionate about a relationship with you. Forty-five minutes later was one of the greatest joys of my life. My own father said to me, Son, if God could do in my life what I've seen him do in yours, I want to give him the opportunity. And right there, my father prayed with me. He prayed a very down-to-earth prayer. As best I can recall, this is what he prayed. God, if you're God and Christ is your son, and if he died on the cross for me, what we saw in the video, and if you can forgive me for what I've done to my family, and if you can do in my life what I've seen you do in the life of my son, then I accept you as my Savior and Lord. Come into my life. I place my trust in you. Forgive me. Well, my ch life was changing about six months a year, year and a half, and still areas being changed. The life of my father was changed right before my eyes. It was like somebody reached down and turned on a light bulb. No, don't get me wrong. I never saw it before. I've never seen it since. Usually the change takes place over a number of months or a year or two. But my daddy only touched alcohol once after that. He was a wino to the core. He drank for so heavy for so many years. Three-fourths of his stomach had to be removed, cut out, and his entire liver was destroyed. But in that 14-month period before he died, over 100 men and women in that little tiny town surrounding area committed their lives to Jesus Christ because of the changed life of the town drunk, my daddy. I've come to one conclusion. I've come to one conclusion with deep convictions that God became man and his name is Jesus and he is passionate about a relationship with you. There were many years that I never believed that. But I thank God someone introduced me to Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you a question. I only want you to answer to yourself. Do you know Christ personally? You say, well, I think so. Then you probably don't. You say, well, I hope so. Then you probably don't. Well, I believe so. Then you probably don't. Look, folks, if you know Jesus Christ personally, you know that you know Jesus Christ personally. That's why the Bible says that you might know. Christianity is not a religion. Don't you believe what a lot of your peers believe, that you work your way to heaven? Absolutely not. That's religion. Religions, men and women trying to work their way to God, that's not Christianity. Christianity is a God who is passionate about a relationship with you and me. It's God coming to us and offering a relationship. There's at least 45 to 50 of you sitting there. And you're thinking like this, Josh... I'd like to know Christ. I'd like to know that I'm forgiven. I'd like to know that if I were to die today where I'd spend eternity. I'd like to know that Christ lives in my heart. You can. I'm going to do for you what Jerry did for me in the university. I'm going to pray out loud the prayer that I prayed to place my trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And maybe the prayer that I prayed would help you right where you're sitting to express that very desire right now. I don't ask you to close your eyes. I don't ask you to bow your heads. Because years ago I learned the key to prayer is not in the position of the body, but the attitude of the heart. You can't give God a snow job. You can't fool him. This is a prayer that I pray, maybe just right now quietly in your own heart. It'll help you to express that very desire. I pray, Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Forgive me and cleanse me. Right this moment, I place my trust in you as Savior and Lord. I accept your forgiveness. Come into my life. Make me the person you created me to be. Many of you just sincerely prayed that prayer with me. If you did, and you want to know that Jesus Christ lives in your heart, you want to know if you were to die today where you'd spend eternity, and most of all, you want to know you're forgiven.
And in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to do something that I was asked to do. I was scared to death when I was a student. I'm going to ask you to do what I was doing. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to just stand up, just like I was asked. I'm going to ask you to make your way out into the aisles and go right through those two doors right back there. It won't take very long, but I'll guarantee you this. I don't think I've ever had one person in 40-some years ever regret doing it. I want some things shared with you that was shared with me that totally made a difference in my life. And so in just a moment, if you prayed that prayer with me like many of you did, and you want to know that Christ lives in your heart, you want to know you're forgiven, you want to know if you were to die today where you'd spend eternity, then just a moment I'm going to ask you to just stand up right where you are. No music, anything. And make your way into the aisles and go right through those two doors back there. There's some of you guys sitting there and your palms are sweaty. You just prayed that prayer and you know you can't move. Say, how do you know, Josh? I've been there and I got a t-shirt to prove it. I was in a little meeting. No more than maybe like the first three rows right there. And the speaker gave an invitation like this and I just prayed the prayer like you just did and I was sincere. And I couldn't move. Nobody responded. Not one person responded. And I sat there and I couldn't move. And he was just at the end of it, just going to close. And a friend of mine, Larry Miner, leaned over to me. Guys, all he said to me was, Josh, would you like me to go with you? Boom, I was right out of that seat right down front. I need, I'll admit it, I needed someone to trigger my faith. I needed someone who loved me enough, who didn't pressure me, but he expressed love. Josh, do you want me to go with you? He died in a head-on car accident three months after that. I really believe, men and women, I was touched by an angel. I really believe that God sent Larry Miner to this earth to say, Josh, would you like me to go with you? So in just a moment, if you just prayed that prayer with me, and you were sincere, and you want to know that you're forgiven, you want to know that Christ lives in your heart, then in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to turn to a friend, say, Jim, Janet, Bob, Joyce, Richard, will you go with me? Will you go with me? It's nothing more beautiful than two guys going together, two girls, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a father, a daughter, a mother, a daughter, a father, a son, a youth pastor with a youth. There's no, nothing more beautiful. I was sharing this in a huge arena, and right at this point, a guy jumps up over there, almost runs right straight across in front of me while I'm speaking, goes way to the end, to the next to the last guy, walked up to the guy, never said a word. The guy in the chair jumped up. They threw their arms around each other and walked out together. I thought, oh, if everyone had someone who had a relationship and a love like that, would you like me to go with you? So right now, if you just prayed that prayer with me, and many of you did, and you were sincere, and you want to know that Christ lives in your heart, you want to know you're forgiven, then right now I want you to turn to a friend and say, will you go with me and stand up right now? Right now. Stand up right where you are, right now. And make your way right out through here, right now. Turn to a friend and say, will you go with me? Ask a friend to come with you. Tonight, I... I place my trust in Christ as Savior and Lord. Turn to a friend and ask them to come with you. Josh, I prayed that prayer with you. I was sincere. I want to know that Christ lives in my heart. I want to know I'm forgiven. Then step out right now. Ask a friend to come with you. If you don't have a friend to turn to, Christ comes with you all the time. Stand up right now. Don't hesitate. Every time I do this, just my mind is flooded with all the images. Folks, I was so scared. I thought I was going to wet my pants. I'm serious. I don't think I could have responded if Larry hadn't turned to me and just said, Josh, would you like me to go with you? Because if I hadn't responded, I wouldn't have been grounded in the faith that I just exercised. Step out right now. Ask a friend to come with you. Tonight, I place my trust in Christ as Savior and Lord. I want to know 
I'm forgiven. I'm going to ask this. This has been a phenomenal response. If you're a youth pastor and you can counsel, I've got to ask you to step out, please. This is too important. I believe the next few minutes in every one of their lives is the most critical minutes of the rest of their lives. If there's any of you that can, can counsel, would you step out right now, please? Thank you. Thank you. Step out right now. It won't take long, but... And you're going to have to take the initiative in there. The gentleman leading it is called Ward Coleman. He's one of the greatest men you will ever meet in your life. I'll tell you this, folks. This Ward Coleman. Of all the people I know in the world, there's not one person I'd rather have, I trust more, to be in that meeting right now than that man. You ought to be in there. It's unbelievable. Those kids will instantly love this man. I can't explain it. It's just, it's thrilling. And the way he explains it to them, and, and, and they just take it in. And afterwards, they'll be lined up for him to individually pray with them, and they'll want a hug from him. And it's marvelous. I take very seriously someone making a decision for Christ because I believe in that 20 minutes after you make that decision, it's probably the most critical 20 minutes you'll ever have in your life because if you don't get it solidified, then you often won't. Outside there you saw some of the resources. This is the book I was talking about. The New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. I wish every high school student, I wish every college student had a copy of this. Almost every question you will ever be confronted with apart from creation is answered right in there. In the university, professors say <laughs> more speeches have been given out of this book and more papers written than any other book in history except for the Bible. And professors can always say, well, I know that was out of evidence. You know why? The papers are always documented. They don't have to quote me. It's all documented. And then one of my all-time favorite books, the one every award out there is, Don't Check Your Brains at the Door. This one here, I took 42 myths that people like you have about Christianity. You think it's true, but it's a myth. 42 different areas, I explode the myth, and then in language that a young person understands, I build the truth up. This will take so much doubting away and, and, and hesitancy about belief. Don't check your brains at the door. And then, one of my all-time favorites, the youth devotion number two, on truth. Young people, I'd like to spend a year with you as a father. In fact, just give me 10 minutes a day only 70% of your days, and I will guarantee you, in one year, you'll not only be thinking differently, you'll be acting differently. And this can be accomplished through this. That's how it was designed. There's other resources out there. If they will help you, it'll make all this gray hair worthwhile. Somebody says, you ought to diet. I said, no way. I worked hard for this. <laughs> Thank you for the privilege of being in your area. Now, when I walked out here, the Eagles were one touchdown behind. It was 28-21. Anybody know what the answer? You don't know? Where's my road hog? He doesn't know out there? We'll get it back to you. They'll probably lose, though. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you, the New York Giants beat the Redskins 36 to nothing. Poor Joe Gibbs. Oh, he better go back to NASCAR. But I'm going to, tonight, I'm going over to the airport, sleep in my bus. I have a tour bus. And tomorrow morning, I'm flying nonstop to Orange County and see my little Scotty James, my grandson, and see my wife, see her first. She always comes first. And then have five days off. But thank you for the privilege of letting me be here with you. God bless.
Let's hear it again for Josh McDowell. Josh, where are you? Are you hiding back there? Praise God, that was absolutely amazing. It was awesome. Wow. Well, I'm going to ask you to remain standing. I want to sing some songs together. And, um, wow. Praise God. This song is really apropos of a lot of stuff that Josh was talking about, how God is passionate about having a relationship with us. And I think it... It's absolutely impossible to compre comprehend how deep and how vast the Father's love is. Um, but even if we can think about it and grab a hold of it just a little bit, it's so overwhelming. And uh, yeah, let's think about that. How deep. vast beyond all measure that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns We sing this one last song, this altar song. God, I know that so much has gone on in my life this week, and 
I know that so much has gone on in the hearts of everyone in this room, um, and I have to be constantly reminded to surrender it, to give it up, to give it up to you because I know that your plans and your, your will for my life is so much greater and more wonderful than I can ever imagine. So God, I just thank you. And as we sing this next song, help me personally uh, to, to surrender to your will. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You would stand up. We are going to end this fabulous evening with an awesome song declaring that we are going to be salt and light in the world. Amen? Amen. All right.